I'd like you to imagine that you're walking through a forest on a hot, dry summer's day. Now, this forest could be in Australia. It could be in Southern California. It could be in Southern Europe, Portugal or Spain. But it's one of those intensely hot, intensely dry days. You can feel the sun beating down on your skin. You can feel the heat in your sinuses and the dryness in the back of your throat. You can smell, almost even taste, the eucalypt leaves and the pine needles that crush under your feet as you walk forward. There is no moisture at all. And then suddenly, you smell something. Maybe you're just imagining it. No, it's there. You smell smoke. And then you realize, looking through the trees, you can see a blue-gray haze hanging in the air. Somewhere nearby is a wildfire. But the winds are light, and you can't tell which direction the smoke is coming from. This could be a very dangerous situation. But let's just take a step back. We hear a lot about forest fires in the news. The coverage is almost exclusively negative. But fires are a natural part of our landscape. Forests need fires to go through so they can regenerate and regrow. The problem is the landscape is no longer natural. It's been said recently that the era that we live in at the moment is called the Pyrocene, the age of fire. Now, the Earth passes through a number of different geological epochs. Go way back, millions of years ago, we have the Jurassic and the Triassic, the age of dinosaurs. Our current epoch is called the Holocene. It started 12,000 years ago at the end of the last ice age and goes through to today. But some people have called this current era the Anthropocene, the age of humans. But a term that's being used more often is the Pyrocene the age of fire. The Pyrocene began uh, about a million years ago when humans first discovered they could use fire for cooking, for heating, for lighting, for making things. And we humans, over the past one million years, have become so good at burning stuff that we have filled our atmosphere with carbon dioxide. And as a result, the atmosphere and the landscape is no longer natural. This past year, 2019-2020 fire season in Australia, we call it the Black Summer. It was one of the worst fire seasons on record. 18 million hectares of land was burnt during the Black Summer. 18 million hectares. That's the size of England and Scotland combined, or the size of Cambodia. 34 lives were lost. It's estimated that 2 billion animals perished in the Black Summer fires and a number of species were pushed to extinction. The 2020 United States fire season saw the destruction of four million hectares of land through fire. Four million hectares. That's the size of Switzerland. 
And now we're seeing fires in places we don't expect them. Alaska, Sweden, Siberia, even Greenland. Over the past couple of years, the United Kingdom has suffered from devastating wildfires. Fire, which has been our friend and ally for the past one million years, is out of control, and we need to fight back. I want you to picture what a modern-day firefighter looks like to you. You're probably thinking a firefighter, men and women on the fire ground, working in hot, dusty, dangerous conditions, wearing heavy, personal, protective equipment, carrying around heavy firefighting gear. If that's your perception of a modern firefighter, you're spot on. I'm a retired volunteer firefighter, and that is exactly what it is like on the fire ground. It is hot, it's dusty, it's dangerous, and it's tough work. What you might not realize as well on the fire ground is the situation is chaotic. There's confusion. You get reports of where the fire is from the incident management team, from spotters in helicopters, from the general public phoning in reports. But you're working in unfamiliar terrain, in smoky, dusty conditions. It can be hard to know where the fire is and how best to deploy the resources to fight that fire. For the past 25 years, I've worked in the aerial survey industry. I'm an aerial survey pilot, and many times I've found myself flying over a wildfire. And from my cockpit of my small plane, I can look out of the window and I can see the whole fire ground laid out underneath me. I can see where the fire is. I can see the smoke column. The angle of the smoke column can tell me how fast that fire is moving. The way the smoke column is billowing can tell me how intense the fire is. I can see properties and houses that are under threat. I can see roads crossing the fire ground that could provide an escape route to anyone who's down there. I can see water resources that could help the, fire, the firefighters. And from my privileged view, my bird's eye view, you could even call it a God's eye view of the fire ground, I can see everything that's going on. And I want to be able to give this view to those people on the ground. And this is something that I reflected on for many, many years. For many years, I was thinking, how can I do this? So after a lot of research and development, bench testing, algorithm development, full starts, we finally developed a system that can create a map of a fire and put it in the hands of someone on the ground. And I'm not just talking about a rough map of, oh, the fire's approximately over here, or a shaky video of the fire going through the forest. I'm talking about an accurate geospatial map that's available in real time. So take yourself back to the forest we were walking through earlier on. You can smell the smoke. You can see the haze of the smoke between the trees. What do you do? You pull out your phone. You open a web browser. You pull up a map of where the fire is. You can see 
where you are, and you can plan your escape route. We can do that today. But then I'm thinking to myself, why stop here? We can create accurate maps of fire. What if we could say, not where is the fire right now, but if, what if we could say, where is the fire going to be in 30 minutes, in 60 minutes, in one hour? What if we could predict where the fire is going to be? Well, in fact, we can do that. How do we do that? Machine learning and artificial intelligence algorithms. But for an artificial intelligence algorithm to determine fire prediction and fire behavior, we need to train that algorithm. We need to teach it what fire behavior looks like. How do we do that? We've got two or three years archive fire maps, tens of thousands of images of fire moving through the landscape. We've got the data set that we can train the AI. And that's what we're doing today. We're training an AI to predict fire behavior based on the data we've collected and used to make fire maps. Let me take you back to a question I asked you earlier on. Imagine what a fire fire looks like. I want you to reimagine that now. Sure, a firefighter is always going to be someone, men and women, on the fire ground, working in dirty, dusty, dangerous environments. But there's another aspect to firefighting as well. This other aspect is advanced sensing technology, satellite communications, high-precision GPS. It's system operators sitting in front of a computer screen in a climate-controlled, air-conditioned room, maybe hundreds of kilometers away from the fire, watching data stream in in real time, analyzing, making tactical decisions, and passing that to the firefighters on the ground. If we bring these two aspects of firefighting together, the boots on the ground, and the AI in the back room. If we bring those together, we can consider the idea of actually putting out fires before they've even really started. Can you imagine the amount of environmental destruction we can avoid? Can you imagine the number of hectares of forests we could save. Can you imagine how good that would be? Thank you.